government open. The true date for Dreamers, of course, is in March. But because Democrats are attaching this to what they want to see as movement with spending, that's why it's up now. Your last thought on this, and then we're going to move on. Absolutely. They're trying to attach it. But look, Chuck and Nancy both demanded clean spending bills, clean budget bills in the past. Now they're going back on their own rule, the Chuck and Nancy rule, which was to pass clean bills uh, as it relates to spending. We have to fund the military first and foremost. That's what this budget does. We want it clean. We don't want to attach any of the president's plans to it. We don't. We expect Democrats to do the same thing and not attach any of their plans to it as well and abide by the own rules that they set forth in the past. All right. This this has happened, and I know many Republicans are going after uh, California Senator Dianne Feinstein for releasing Fusion GPS t testimony. Fusion GPS, of course, that company that put together the anti-Trump dossier. She did this unilaterally on her own. Uh, we know Senator Chuck Grassley is not happy about that. Uh, what says the White House? Well, look, it's it's kind of laughable here. I mean, the the, the for Senator D Dianne Feinstein to do this uh, under the guise of transparency, we want the facts to get out. But so much of the report is redacted. It's just absolutely not uh, absolute nonsense. But look, the media continues to be distracted by tabloid trash books and this type of uh, unsubstantiated uh, dossier that even Senator Feinstein said that there was no collusion uh, with Russia and and this president. But moving forward in this, uh, we realize that uh, the media will be distracted, but this president won't be distracted. In fact, uh, in the face of all of these things, he, set, uh, he has record-setting accomplishments in record-setting time. Now, as you just pointed out, we're moving mm -hmm. forward, trying to protect the American people, do something about immigration, but also focus on infrastructure, which was the subject of the cabinet meeting just now behind my shoulders here. So this president is not going to be deterred by simple petty politics uh, by Senator Dianne Feinstein. Well, and from what I'm reading, and we'll talk with Representative Jim Jordan about this more just moments from now, Hogan is, is that we want to just find out how this actually uh, impairs or, or affects the investigation. So I'll ask him that question and move on now to Steve Bannon with you. I, I'm curious to know what the president has to say about Bannon stepping down from Breitbart. I don't know that we have a comment about him stepping down uh, from Breitbart. That's his decision. But I did see the comment where Steve Bannon made the point that he'll resurface again when the president needs him. Look, the president didn't need him uh, when he beat 16 Republican candidates, probably the most accomplished in, uh, in history. He defeated him without Steve Bannon's help. We passed tax reform without Steve Bannon's help. Uh, the president was able to cut regulations without Steve Bannon's help. If anybody in this situation needs help, it's Steve Bannon because he needs help finding a job. Wow. A political operation in 2018 is what his job is going to be, according to Steve Bannon. Last word on this. Do you see yourselves in the White House or this administration running oppositional to anything that Steve Bannon would put together? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what the future will bring. I'll just say if Steve Bannon's political operation is, uh, is as effective as it was in Alabama, then uh, he's going to be looking for more than a job. You are not mincing words. Hogan Gidley from the White House, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Meanwhile, Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley speaking out against the committee's ranking Democrat, Senator Dianne Feinstein. Remember, I said I was going to go deeper on this with our next guest for releasing Glenn Simpson's testimony. Obviously, I was a little disappointed because I had an understanding ahead of time that it'd be released when we both agreed to release it. And I think I've shown my cooperation with uh, the other side uh, by y just yesterday uh, agreeing to two interviews that they want of their, at their request. And so I think we're going to move forward without any uh, glitch uh, in the way we've been operating. Senator well, here's what Senator Feinstein said in a statement, quote, the innuendo and misinformation circulating about the transcript are part of a deeply troubling effort to undermine the investigation into potential collusion and obstruction of justice. The only way to set the record straight is to make the transcript public. Republican Jim Jordan sits on the House Judiciary Committee and Oversight Committees. So what was your first reaction when you learned this? Well, I mean, it is what it is. It's out there. Uh, as I looked at it, it seems to me to confirm that the FBI was telling Christopher Steele first that there was an investigation going on. And second, what is the FBI telling Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier, paid for by the Democrat National Committee in the Clinton campaign, what is the FBI doing telling him that there's supposedly some second source at, at, for, for information about the Russia investigation? So that's troubling. And then when you take what you learn from that and couple it with the story yesterday from John Solomon in the Hill, 
where he talks about more text messages from Peter Strzok and Lisa Page mm -hmm. that highlight they were leaking things to the press to further their narrative, to accomplish their plan. I think all that together yesterday just confirms what we suspected. Top people at the FBI look like they had a plan to undermine the Trump campaign. So by releasing this by Dianne Feinstein, unilaterally on her own, she didn't check with anybody else that we know yeah. on the committee. She, she goes ahead and does this. What impact does this have on the overall investigation? I don't think a great deal. I mean, it would have been nice if they would have done it together, as Mr. Grassley, uh, Chairman Grassley pointed out. But it is what it is. Uh, it's not the first time someone in Washington has done something on their own, leaked some information. But what I look at is what did we learn from it? And we learned something that should not happen. The FBI was telling Christopher Steele there was an investigation. The uh -huh. FBI, sh uh, sh according to Glenn Simpson's testimony, the FBI shared with Christopher Steele, again, the author of the dossier, shared with Christopher Steele the fact that there was supposedly some second source. Who that is, we're not sure. You know, it's interesting. What I'm learning from you now is, okay, let's just let this sit out there, but let's take a closer look and look at what we can learn from it. What are the types of gaps that you think you can fill in from this Fusion GPS transcript? Yeah, I think it only confirmed what we, th what, what, what we thought and what I said earlier, that there was a, remember the one text message between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page? We, they said, we need an insurance policy. We need a plan to make sure the American people don't elect Donald Trump as the next president. What was part of that plan? I think it was using Christopher Steele's work product, the dossier, as the basis to go to the FISA court and get warrants to spy on Americans. And I think it was also part of their plan to take information leak it to the press to further their narrative and further their plan, almost this self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing yeah. that they were engaged in. That all was confirmed in this, this, this uh, Simpson testimony, coupled with, again, what we've learned now in the additional text messages that are coming to light yeah. as evidenced by the reporting of John Solomon yesterday. You know, the one unfortunate thing with the release, though, and, and I don't know how hard you'll press to get uh, Glenn Simpson, but you do want to get him, you do want to hear from him. Does this give him a way of saying, no, you've got my transcripts, you don't get any else from me no I don't I don't think so I mean if, if, if there needs to be further uh, further interviews further depositions further questions I'm sure that will happen at the appropriate time but I want to talk to Peter Strzok I want to talk to Lisa Page I want to talk to uh, FBI general counsel used to be general counsel he's been demoted uh, Jim mm -hmm. Baker I want to talk to all those people at the at the FBI the top people the FBI uh, uh, who, who I think orchestrated this whole affair before I let you go Congressman Jordan at the end of the day what what is the penalty what is the accountability here? I mean, you, you find out that potentially there's bias at the FBI, and what happens? Well, first of all, you got to get all the answers. You got to get the answers to the important questions. You got to bring that 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 public, and then and then see. Maybe there maybe there will be uh, finally a second uh, special counsel appointed by Jeff Sessions. Maybe we will have to have criminal referrals, as Mr. Graham mm. and Senator Grassley did last week for Christopher Steele. We don't know, but we can't get to that point if we first don't get the information the appropriate documents, information, and access to the witnesses who need to be deposed and who need to be questioned. Did Diane Feinstein then maybe do you a favor? At least this is out there. I don't think it's that harmful, frankly. And as I said, I think it kind of confirms some of the things we mm -hmm. already suspected and where the evidence is all pointing. Congressman Jim Jordan, great to see you. Thank you very you much. We just briefly talked about it. Steve Bannon out at Breitbart News. In the wake of a very public feud with President Trump, will the former chief strategist remain an influential political voice with the midterm elections looming. And for whom? Which candidates will jump on board with him? We'll go in depth. And House lawmakers weighing whether to renew a controversial surveillance program the Trump administration says will help protect our nation. But some lawmakers say it needs better oversight to protect Americans' privacy. Senator Rand Paul says he's going to filibuster and he'll give us his take. The thing is, is when you gather information from foreigners in foreign lands without the Constitution, that information is not gathered with constitutional protections and should never be used against Americans. This is a bedrock principle. Deep dive now on this alert. Steve Bannon stepping down from his top post at Breitbart News amid tensions with the White House, specifically the president. In his re resignation statement, Steve Bannon said, quote, I'm proud of the work the Breitbart team has accomplished in so short a period of time in building out a world-class news platform, end quote. Meanwhile, the Washington Post is reporting Steve Bannon told associates he plans to focus on creating a political operation in 2018 and that he predicts Trump, the president, I would say, will need to help 
uh, from him again in the future once Republican leaders desert the president. Joining me now is Michael Blake, vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. Kaylee McEnany is an RNC spokesperson as well and author of the new book, The New American Revolution, The Making of the Populist Movement. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Michael, great to see you. Great to All see right. You. So, uh, Kaylee, what is this going to look like? A brand new operation by Steve Bannon. Well, I don't imagine it will be very successful, Harris. You know, this book I wrote about the election, 321 pages, not one mention of Steve Bannon, because when I traveled the country talking to Americans, they were not excited about Steve Bannon. They were excited about President Donald Trump. And I know some in the mainstream media are concerned about finding the mastermind behind President Trump. President Trump is his own mastermind. The base is energized solely and exclusively by him. All right. You know, it's interesting when I look at the situation and I think of people kind of going rogue. One name that pops up is the former DNC chair, uh, Donna Brazil. And so in some ways you have seen a little bit of something like this, Michael, uh, on your side of the political aisle. What do you make of it? We haven't seen anything like this where you had the, the master mind of the political operation uh, going against the sitting president and them essentially attacking each other. We have not seen a scenario where you have a, a tell all author talking about on the record conversations happening in the White House. Uh, however, what we want to actually focus on is what's not happening. The more we're talking about this, the less we're talking about why hasn't Chip been exercised and continued? Well, what are we doing to make sure that federal government is actually getting the funding that they need? That's what we have to be focused on. On rather than the distractions that are happening in this conversation. The child health care insurance program is what you're talking about. But, you know, you say that directly to me, but I, I think Kaylee probably wants to talk directly to you about what you just said. Right. You know, the Republican Party, it's no secret we had our divisions leading up to the election of Donald Trump. But when you looked, Harris, just two weeks ago at the Rose Garden ceremony of tax cuts, you had Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump and all stripes of our party standing together unified. Meanwhile, Democrats, there was a Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders, running against the establishment Hillary Clinton. The DNC was in the tank for Hillary. We now know that. There are deep wounds and divisions in the Democratic Party. Steve Bannon's of no moment to Republicans, but the DNC has a lot to answer for, for why they propped up Clinton at the expense of Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders. Look you're, no you're farther probably right. than the recent award show when Oprah popped up, and every Democrat that I have talked with has said, okay, yeah, fine for her, but we probably want to get somebody who's a politician. Well, let's talk about the elections. I mean, I'm happy to focus on that since Kaylee's bringing that up. We could talk about how we won in Alabama. We could talk about how we won in Virginia, which it was being communicated that we would lose that race. We can talk about how we've had races won all across the country. So clearly we're doing something right at the DNC and across the Democratic partners. If we want to talk about what the Republicans should be focusing on, it's what are you going to be doing in Arizona now that you have Joe Arpaio saying that he's going to be running for the United States Senate. So there are things that we should be focusing on in the immediate. How do we make sure people get jobs? How do you make sure people get health care and to make it seem as if the RNC and others are not talking about what's happening. Yes, you could talk about what occurred at, at the Rose Garden, uh, an effort where a tax plan that over the long term, 70 percent of Americans will see their taxes go up. That comes from a nonpartisan institute. And the Tax Policy Center, by the way, which is left leaning, says 80 percent of Americans will see a tax cut. And Next year well, alone, no, This year, starting, yeah. starting well, on, in February, you know, we have a, an agenda of success, a record achievement, record rescinding of regulations under Donald Trump, record acceptance and confirmation of, of circuit court judges, tax cuts like we haven't seen in 30 years. Democrats, you have negativity, you have Russian collusion and ludicrous arguments about mental fitness. My, meanwhile, we have bipartisan success, as we saw at the meeting yesterday, a president who wants to bring you the know, party together. I mean, a success I, I where do, you just had I, a judge say that you're going to block DACA because it's an unconstitutional ban. So again, we won't talk about success. Let's talk about the you track record. You do realize there are four Republicans whom the president has been touting, and we can talk about it, that the bill is coming out today on immigration uh, reform, uh, and it looks directly at where Democrats said that they, they wanted to focus, and that's DACA and the Dreamers. I mean, it will be woefully sad for Democrats, for lack of a better word, um, if you guys are not at the table when these decisions are being made. So, you know, there was an opportunity yesterday. Some of, of the Democrats took it to talk about these issues. I want to talk about money, though, because I saw some, some fundraising numbers that, I, I mean, I'm curious to know, Kaylee, you guys are raking in the cash and how the Democrats are going to answer back, first of all. Right. We've raised, I, I love my DNC counterpart here, but we've raised double that the DNC has. We have seven times cash on hand advantage. And what's so impressive, Harris, is a record number of 
small donations, people pulling out their wallets, everyday Americans, and filling the coffers at the RNC because of enthusiasm for Donald Trump. Democrats are going to have a hard map ahead. So where, why is there a gap in, in cash for the Democrats right now? Well, in large part because you have larger donors that give to the Republican Party, but let's stay focused on this. Wait a minute. Uh, again, again, that's You've just... You've got some big donors. Yeah, Come again, on. 98% of direct Harris, contributions Harris, are small donors. I think donors. sometimes, Harris, you, you missed the point that I just conveyed. I said there are larger donors. I didn't say we don't have large donors. Number two, again, we want to talk about the facts. In 2006, the RNC outraised the DNC two to one. And what do we know happened there? We took back the majority. So it's about do you have the resources to actually win? It's not just about the large donors. Number three, you actually said something that was inaccurate earlier. You said that we're not at the table when it comes to DACA and what's happening on the conversations. We have been engaged, but we have said repeatedly it should be, this should be focused purely on DACA, not around what's being proposed. Wait, Harris, itself. Harris, is, conversation Harris is right to say you're not engaged. When I watched that bipartisan meeting yesterday, I saw Trump wanting a permanent fix. Remember, Obama had an unconstitutional fix with that executive order for DACA and put these people in the situation. And let's not forget yesterday, Dianne Feinstein saying, we've tried this before. It didn't work. You used to be the party of yes, we can under Obama. Now it's no, we won't. All right. We're going to bring you back. Michael, Kaylee, wow, thank you. Thank you. All right, Always we'll good. move thank on. You. A group of House Republicans are about to release their own immigration bill. I just said it. And how it may square with what was decided in the White House meeting yesterday. Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy was in that room, and now he'll be on overtime. Stay close. Fox's alert, a group of House Republicans are expected to release an immigration bill within hours. Just a day after President Trump hosted a bipartisan meeting at the White House to talk about immigration reform, the bill will reportedly offer legal status to dreamers, immigrants brought here illegally as children, but will also include several measures Democrats have already rejected, such as penalties for sanctuary cities. I'm joined now by Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, a Republican from California. He was at that meeting at the White House. His first time on Outnumbered Overtime. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, thanks for having my inaugural opportunity here. Absolutely. Let's talk first about where we are with regard to the bill that's coming later today. Uh, we're starting to get some dribs and drabs, but I know you say it fits into an overall view, but first the Goodlatte bill and the other three that are expected to come out. Well, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, Chairman of Judiciary, this is what he's been working on for quite some time. And remember, the Democrats have kind of drugged their feet thinking DACA just by itself to be able to pass. Well, if you do that, you're going to be right back at this problem next year as well. So you've got to have border security. We've got to do something about chain migration when you look at the uh, bomber just in New York a couple months ago. And then the lottery system of changing that into a merit system of how it's based. But the bill by Chairman Goodlatte goes much further, deals with sanctuary cities, which we passed off this floor. Kate's Law, which we passed off this floor, too, is inside there. And then he goes into also about guest workers, E-Verify, and some other things. So it's a much broader immigration reform bill, but mm -hmm. it also deals with DACA as well. And I said the other three, I want to be fair, Representatives Labrador, McCall, and McSally are also with the Chairman yeah. Goodlatte on this bill. So talk to me just about where the president was uh, toward the end of that meeting that we got to see before the reporters were booted out, but it was a lot to take in 55 minutes live. Um, where was the president finally in the idea of what will be talked about uh, before next Friday, the government shutdown date, the deadline, January 19th, in terms of immigration? What will be included? Well, the president was exactly at the end of the meeting where he was at the beginning. First of all, he said, we have a funding debate going on with our military. And we all know the challenges for our military and what's happening around the world. So what he asked is, let's not play politics with the military. Let's get our budget agreement and move forward with that. But to deal with DACA, because that's not till March and with the recent court case, maybe that's a little later. But what he says, to deal with DACA, let's deal with four issues. And let's only talk about those four. And when the president refers to DACA, that's what he's talking about. Dealing with DACA, dealing about border security, dealing about chain migration, um, and then dealing about the lottery system. Those are the four elements and principles, what we all agreed to in that room after, uh, at the end of the meeting, that that's where we would have our focus, that's where we'd have our discussions as we move forward. Um, the leaders in there, we will get together today and then we'll put that group back together hopefully tomorrow and the next day to continue our work to solve this problem. You know, as I looked at that meeting, it felt epic. 
And, and I was watching social media during it that people had never seen the curtain pulled back yeah. quite that way for that long. What was it like for you as you look back over your career? Well, you know, I've never been in a, I've been in a lot of meetings, but never sure. with the media right there. And normally what happens in a meeting like that, because the media wants to see what's happening, you bring them in for the beginning, which people say the spray, mm -hmm. where they would take a picture, take a little video, the, the president would make a comment. But this is what's so unique about this president. He wanted to make sure on a fair basis, and this all started when I was with at Camp David with him this week, and he was telling me how earlier last week he was with some Republican senators talking about DACA. They all agreed, but he said, we can't solve that unless we bring Democrats in the room too. So give him a lot of credit. He brought both sides both chambers and he's trying to use that what he's so good at at the art of the deal trying to get an agreement here and then he let the media just see it so the american public sure. and he, to me though okay well as sometimes can happen in live television you'll get a satellite freeze and unfortunately that has happened now with the majority leader kevin mccarthy we will bring him back as we can but we certainly wait we got him back look at you Wow, technology. Now, it's, yes. it's, I was explaining to the audience, sometimes the satellite will freeze. has nothing to do generally with weather. It's just technology. And it seldom works out that you come back, but we're so grateful. All right, so <laughs> uh, to further this point, because we did see some contentious moments, which I think are valuable for the American public to see. We saw Cuellar of Texas with his charts and things. What was it like in those moments? Because sometimes you can shut a conversation down. Do you feel like you're moving forward? I felt that meeting was one of the most productive meetings. I'll tell you this, Congressman Cuellar, he just stopped me on the floor and said that was a great meeting. When can we meet again? And he was starting to think about those elements that we just talked about prior on mm -hmm. some ideas of where they can go. That is what the uniqueness of President Trump was able to do and what the American public should see. People do have different philosophies. They should be able to freely express them and their ideas. But this building and our, our country is based upon compromise. And that's what you're going to see at the end of the day. There's going to have to be compromise on both sides, but you're going to have to stick to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. and you're going to have to find where the common ground is. I, I hear the optimism in your voice, and I know the American public, no matter where you are in, in politics, it's great to see people working together. You know, there's hope moving forward. I want to ask you about this, though. This is breaking. Uh, Representative yes. Daryl Issa, um, also of your home state of California, has just announced that he is retiring. Uh, with that, that brings us to 46 representatives who are retiring or running for other office. 32 of them are Republicans. Uh, three senators are Republicans who are retiring. You've got um, kind of an institutional knowledge drain with, with chairmen leaving their offices or in Hatch in Utah, for example. How do you go forward in a midterm year and lead and get things done knowing that you've got some exit points of some pretty strong people in your party? Well, first of all, we'll finish out 20, 2018 very strong because they're not exiting. They got another year to go. So you have that brain power still here. But remember, one thing that Republicans do, we don't pick chairman based upon the not amount of years you served in Congress. It's your ability. And Chairman uh, Issa was already a chairman of oversight. He did a tremendous job there. He served here a number of years. He wants to go off and to do something else as well. He's been a very successful businessman. Same thing with uh, Mr. Royce. He, he's term limited as chairman. Uh -huh. And same thing with Schuster. So, yeah, are there more Republicans? Yes, because there's more Republican members. And a number of members who are departing, like Christy Nome, she's running mm -hmm. for governor of South Dakota. Yeah, other offices. Or you got Di yeah, Diane Black. So they're actually moving up. We will bring more people in. It'll be successful in that. And that's the uniqueness that we have. The competition makes even people better. Yeah, and one of the things I'm reading, too, is if you look statistically, you always lose some people along the way right after an election sometimes, other parts of the year, too. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, because Representative Issa has been very vocal on certain items, and just get your thoughts. So I appreciate that. Uh, Majority Leader, will you come back another time? I will gladly come back. We'll have the satellite complete for the whole time. Look at you. Just ruling it. <laughs> thank you. Happy New Year. All right. Thank you. The White House is weighing its options as some big deadlines are fast approaching for the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, recertification, that's the question. Whether President Trump will continue to waive sanctions and the potential impact of pulling out of that deal completely. Up next, Senator Rand Paul to talk about it all. Stay close.
Well, it's about to get chippy, as we say in hockey. Ahead of a House vote expected to come tomorrow on whether to reauthorize a controversial FISA surveillance program, allowing the government to surveil non-U.S. citizens abroad as part of counterterrorism measures. It expires January 19th. But today, a bipartisan group of House and Senate lawmakers are threatening to derail that bill unless protections are added for law-abiding Americans who get caught up in that surveillance. We understand that there are threats overseas, foreign targets, people we have to be concerned about to protect the safety of the American people. What we're against is without a warrant having the communications of law-abiding Americans swept up in that process. Well, you saw a Democrat there. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul was also at that news conference today. And I know you say you're willing to filibuster that bill now. Uh, the senator is with us. Why? Well, you know, I think when we talk about the Bill of Rights, an integral part of our Constitution, it is worth filibustering. It's worth trying to say, you know what, we will have to obey the Bill of Rights. Americans need these protections. So, for example, this spy program is intended to spy on foreigners in foreign lands. I'm for it. It's a way to protect ourselves against enemies. However, as they spy on foreigners, they collect a lot of Americans. We're talking about millions of American phone calls and emails are in this data base. Innocent Americans, they're incidentally collected. They're collected in sort of peripheral ways. They were never the target of anything, but they're in the database. The data is collected without any constitutional protections. I'm okay with that with foreigners, but for Americans, the Constitution always applies. I don't want domestic law enforcement searching this big database that's supposed to be on foreigners mm -hmm. and trying to accuse people of domestic crimes. I think the Constitution applies to everybody, every American here, and it is worth filibustering over. Yeah, so what you're saying is that we've agreed through our Constitution to lower the bar where foreigners have access to those rights, that's fine, but all of us have to be protected at a certain higher level. So the question then is, how do you, how do you change it and, and keep us safe at the same time? Because you do have, Senator, people arguing, well, we'll just give up some freedom so you can keep us <laughs> safe. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that's what the terrorists are trying to take away from us, is our rule of law, our freedoms, our uh, American tr traditions of Bill of Rights. That's what we're fighting to preserve. So if we give up that because we're fearful of terrorists, mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, will it, have, will it have all been worthwhile, all the thousands of American soldiers who died to defend the Constitution? I think you can have both. I have no problem with spying on foreigners in foreign lands, and they don't get constitutional protections. Sure. But if you accidentally or incidentally gather up millions of Americans. Here, here's an example. Right now, the Justice Department has decided they're going to go after medical marijuana in Colorado. Colorado has legalized this. We have this enormous database. Would you want the uh, U.S. government to be searching through a database on foreigners that's incidentally collecting information on Americans and then have the federal government go and try to overturn Colorado's law? So there's a lot of things that really should involve the Constitution. Any American accused of a crime deserves the Fourth Amendment, which says the government can't look at your stuff unless they have probable cause you've committed a crime, they have to name you, and they have to say what they're looking for. This is information has been gathered with no constitutional protections. It's just all scarfed up by the millions and millions. And so we have to be very careful about letting the government just look at that without any kind of control. Well, your hallmark on Congress has been your ability to filibuster. So we look forward to seeing what you will say about this. Uh, it, it's an interesting point. I think, again, people are in that comfort zone of we just want to be safe. But what you're talking about potentially that can go wrong is very important for us to know about. Just before I let you go, and we don't have a lot of time, but I want to talk about the Iran nuke deal deadline that's approaching uh, and where you think we will be when that, that deadline gets here. You know, I think with the Iranian agreement, I had misgivings in the beginning because I was worried that we gave too much too early and whether or not they would continue to comply. But everything I've seen so far is that Iran has complied with the nuclear agreement, so I think we ought to keep it. 
they are not necessarily doing what we want on the ballistic side, developing conventional warfare, but that's not part of the agreement. So I'm a little different than some. Some people want to tear up the agreement. I think we should be actually negotiating a new agreement on ballistic missiles with them and trying to continue to engage. And I think ultimately the Iranian people, uh, once they see that we're not interested in invading their country, most mm. of the Iranian people would like mm -hmm. to oversee, like to see the Revolutionary Guard and the mullahs overthrown. But I think it could actually work the opposite direction if we begin destroying the agreements we have with you them. You know, it's interesting what you say because it, it buys a little time to give that revolution, uh, which is what I call it, uh, a chance to take hold and, and move forward. That's an interesting perspective on it. So based on what you're saying, we might see the president recertify uh, and keep that in place uh, so that the conversation can continue there on the ground in Iran, potentially. Uh, Senator Rand Paul, great to see you. Great to see you in good health. And happy new year to you. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be right back.